I'd like to thank CRI for inviting me to talk at this meeting. I'd also like to take the opportunity to thank CRI on behalf of the medical profession because CRI have strongly supported the cause of sports cardiology and indeed reducing the risk of, of sudden death in the young. And I think the medical profession, cardiologists in particular, have not always been as supportive as perhaps they could be. So I'd like to thank on behalf of my patients um, how much they have helped. So um, my name is Graham Stewart. I'm a cardiologist. I'm based in Bristol. Um, my day job is as a cardiologist and elective physiologist working with congenital heart disease, mostly working with children and with young adults with either congenital heart disease or inherited cardiac conditions. Um, my uh, conflict is that I also run a sports cardiology clinic through the auspices of Sports Cardiology UK. And in that I see a number of, of athletes um, with cardiac issues. My topic today is a difficult one. That is to deal with cardiovascular screening of children. Um, and specifically children under the age of 14 years. And as you've, you've heard with all the screening we've talked about so far, they've specifically excluded young children. Um, the sort of children we're talking about is like this girl. This is Holly, a patient of mine. Holly is an elite athlete, albeit one that's 11 and a half. This picture was taken a week before her mum sent me this. This is Athletics Weekly. And she was delighted because Holly had done extremely well. She had just become the Somerset and Avon cross-country champion for the under 13-year-olds. And the previous day, she actually came second in the English school's equivalent. So I suppose what we're addressing here is, should athletes, elite athletes, like Holly, under the age of 14, undergo some form of cardiovascular screening? Now, nothing's new under the sun, and cardiovascular screening of children is no different. Um, this paper is from Circulation, way back in 1964. And this particular paper looked at the issue of heart disease screening in school children. And these authors... Um, decided to compare the, the current technology for screening, which was using community physicians, with a new high-fidelity technique, um, listening to heart sounds. And what they did was they got three cardiologists to listen to these uh, phonocardiograms. And interestingly, what they found was that all three of the cardiologists experienced, experienced severe listener fatigue and soporific effect of listening to the heart through earphones. I think that means they fell asleep. And the authors concluded that neither the community physicians or the high-technique uh, phonocardiograms were very effective. Indeed, they were equally inefficient in detecting heart disease, except that the high-tech method was two to three times as expensive. So there was scepticism about the benefit of screening school children for heart disease way back in 1964. And that scepticism in screening in general, as we've heard earlier, persists in the medical profession today. Um, this was a paper taken from the British Medical Journal about three weeks ago, and it was pointing out that many of the cancer screening trials fail to uh, discuss issues such as overdiagnosis or harm produced from the actual screening process. Um, similarly, this uh, paper um, talks about overdiagnosis of non progressive uh, cancer in the breast mammography screening, and this is a really hot topic at present. Uh, that's for, for women. Men are not, not uh, escaping from this. So prostate cancer screening, uh, the whole issue of, de of detecting prostate cancer using prostate-specific uh, antigen screening, this review paper again published this year in the BMJ concluded that physicians should recommend against PSA screening because actually picking up these early cancers and treating them produces more morbidity than leaving them well alone. So the scepticism in the medical profession about the benefits of these big screening pro programs. However, compare that with this situation. Uh, these uh, happy-looking children are from Ardbreck uh, Primary School in Creef in Perthshire. Um, my sister's two sons went to that school. And a number of years ago, my sister was at the school sports day. And um, she was about to watch her 10-year-old her, uh, run in a 100 meters race. This was the preceding race. When this happened, little boy, 10-year-old, ran like the wind, came second in the race, collapsed, and my sister, who's a midwife, was involved in the unsuccessful resuscitation of this little boy. And she phoned me, understandably a bit concerned and upset that night, and said, 
look, should my children be being screened? And so on one hand, we've got the medical scepticism about the benefits of the epidemiological benefits of mass screening programs. On the other hand, you've got the very real issue of young children collapsing in this circumstance, thinking surely there's some way of preventing uh, this terrible outcome. So in addressing the issue of cardiovascular screening of children, I'd like to first of all look at the issue of children and exercise. And that's perhaps one of the biggest epidemiological and public health issues that we face in the UK just now. Secondly, I'd like to look at the rather different situation of child athletes and exercise. I'd like then to discuss briefly some of the conditions we should be concerned about, many of which we've heard a lot about over the last two days. I'd like to try to address the question, should we screen? And then, if we should screen, how should we do it? So let's first of all consider children and exercise. For the first time this year, the British Heart Foundation have produced separate data for children and young people um, in their statistics package. And the reason they've done so is this sort of thing. And this is a, a complicated graph uh, looking at physical activity levels for children uh, divided into um, age and country and gender. Uh, it's a complicated graph, but let me simplify it for you. Basically, what it shows is that two-thirds of boys in this country don't meet government-recommended activity levels. These are levels set at which we think there's a definite health benefit. And more than two-thirds of girls are in the same situation. So our children are not exercising. Moreover, in Northern Ireland uh, and Wales, where we've more up-to-date data in 2009-2011, we can see that, that that trend is increasing. So children are doing less and less uh, exercise. So less exercise activity. What else is happening? Well, this is what's happening. Overweight and obesity in children is gradually climbing. So here you can see you right up here to 2011. And this graph, irrespective of gender and indeed uh, country within the United Kingdom, is climbing. Such that one third of children in this country are now classified as overweight or obese, with all the public health issues that may lead them to develop in years to come. So what are we doing about it? Well, this is what we're doing about it. They've got reduced exercise activity, increasing obesity. So are we uh, encouraging them to do more sport and more physical activity at school? Well, these are um, graphs, um, again, from the British Heart Foundation, showing that in primary school we're doing not too badly. Almost 70% are reaching the, the recommended levels, but look what happens as soon as they get into senior school. There's a gradual fall-off such that only 20% of school children, by the time they're leaving school, are meeting the uh, recommended guidelines to uh, get a sufficient amount of sport and exercise for health benefits. So that's the situation uh, with children. So they're getting less activity, we're giving them less activity to do, and they're getting increasingly obese. And perhaps, well, as I say, said earlier, that's one of the most important public health messages from this talk. Um, what about child athletes and exercise? Well, there's no doubt that children, are, uh, modern elite child athletes, are capable of huge athletic feats. This girl has been spotted already for the uh, Rio Olympics uh, in weightlifting. Uh, I think she personally needs drug tested myself. But it's, it's my perception that child athletes are doing not only more than their parents did, and their grandparents did, but at an elite level, they're doing more even than their elder brothers and elder sisters. I think they're doing more than ever before. And uh, I tried to find some uh, concrete evidence for that, and that's actually very difficult to obtain because nobody publishes how much uh, training these children are doing. Some of you in the audience may well know better than I do. But um, this uh, little abstract uh, I found interesting. This was actually from one of the American sports medicine conferences. They were actually looking at sports injuries um, and they found that injuries, not surprisingly, were more common in those young children spending more than 21 hours per week in sport and exercise, which in my experience is not that uncommon, particularly in the swimmers and the rowers. How much is that? Well, this uh, chap is Scott Neidley, who until recently was Britain's most successful male long-distance triathlete. And when he was working as a full-time professional triathlete, he was training for 22 to 25 hours per week. But that training was interspersed with forced rests. So he would, he would have a sleep in the afternoon. He was having massage. He was in physio. He was in chiropractory. 
Compare that to the elite child athlete, many of whom are doing more than 20 hours per week. But that's interspersed with school, it's interspersed with uh, studies and exams, and even the attempts to have a social life. So we've got ch children who are elite athletes now exercising far more than ever before. So we have two extremes. We have a bimodal distribution. On one hand, we've got the increase in the obese children doing less and less exercise. And then at the other end of the spectrum, you've got the elite child athletes training harder, longer, and more intensely. So what conditions should we be concerned about for particularly these elite child athletes? Well, we've heard a lot about criticism of the data which are available. And th these are very valid criticisms. I've, I've looked at two particular papers um, which might help us understand what's going on. This is a, a prospectus study from Oregon, uh, published uh, in 2009. A, a population-based prospectus study, relatively short period, only three years. And they looked at emergency room data uh, for a relatively small population, about 600,000. And what they found was that sudden cardiac death in this study was rare under the age of 14. Um, it represented only 2% of all sudden cardiac arrests. The annual instance on this study was 1.7 per 100,000, and I found Steve's data uh, quite compelling. And what they did was, uh, that's compared to 60,000 in their overall population, and they excluded identifiable non-cardiac causes such as drowning. That was a mistake. Anybody who's dealing with this sort of uh, situation will very quickly learn patterns. And if you hear of a child who's jumped into the water, who's collapsed, you hear probably every week or two in, in the news, uh, who's collapsed, immediately that raises alarm bells, thinks this child has probably got a channelopathy, either CPVT or long QT syndrome. Long QT type 1, commonest form of long QT syndrome, usually relatively easy to diagnose on an ECG. Uh, and more than 90% of events occur during exercise. Uh, this is data from uh, Schwartz, who's done a lot of work in long QT. And this looks, the cu this looks at the cumulative event-free survival risk. That line's put at uh, 14 years. And the more than 70% of long QT1 patients will have had a, a cardiovascular event by the age of 14 years. So the vast majority of these events are occurring in young children before they'd normally be being screened in any way. This thicker line represents Gerber-Lange and Nelson syndrome, which is the, uh, usually is a compound uh, uh, type of uh, mutation which is associated with sensory neural deafness, and that's even more likely to occur in young children. Moreover, not only will these children have a very high chance of having an event by the age of 14, 90% will have occurred on exercise, and unlike in the adult population, where it's more common in women, in the paediatric population, it's much more common in boys. So that's one paper. They, they excluded uh, drowning and, uh, uh, as a non-cardiac cause, which is clearly a mistake. The second paper is by Mayer. This is from uh, Jonathan Dresner's group. And again, uh, this is, a, unlike the last one, this is a retrospective study, a uh, much longer period. Um, they looked at the emergency services cardiac arrest database in the sort of King County in Washington. And they, they identified 361 cases, that is, patients under the age of 35. 26 of these were infants. 30 of these were probably the sort of age range we would be looking at, which is uh, 3 to 13. 60 were 14 to 24, and the biggest number were 25 to 35. And these are the, shows the different breakdown of causes of, of death. And these are much the same as what we've heard uh, earlier. But notably, the infants, largely, it was congenital heart disease that was the primary cause. And in this American study, coronary artery disease was by far the biggest cause, even in these relatively young athletes, 25 to 35. However, this, these two age groups were relatively similar uh, in terms of their, their breakdown with cardiomyopathies, inherited arrhythmia disorders uh, being the most common uh, causes. So looking at that in more detail, so congenital heart disease was 21%, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy 18%, long QT and the primary arrhythmias worked out at about another quarter. And then there were various things such as aortic dissection, anomalous coronary arteries and so on, myocarditis 
uh, making up the rest. Primary arrhythmias, they, they had a fairly loose definition of those patients who were known to have recurrent VET, ventricular fibrillation, or known history of supraventricular tachycardia. So these are the conditions to be concerned about. Arrhythmias, cardiomyopathies, and congenital or structural lesions. And that's true under the age of 14. Indeed, it's also true over the age of 14, but you add in ischemic heart disease. So the nubbins of this question, should we be screening these children well, what do the existing protocols recommend? Let's have a look at what the existing protocols recommend. And I think this uh, Seattle criteria is a big advance And what we were hearing yesterday about uh, Sanji and the CRI groups, uh, St. George's groups, amendments to that is, is perhaps even more so. So Seattle criteria gives quite nice uh, description of the normal ECG in the athlete and the things that we should be looking out for. However... If you look at the small print of this, the criteria define ECG disorders that warrant further cardiovascular evaluation for disorders that predispose to sudden cardiac death in asymptomatic athletes aged 14 to 35. And this is the same in every single one of these uh, screening protocols and consensus recommendations. They exclude children under the age of 14. That begs the question, why do they do that? Is there some sort of a bias against children? Well, they do it for a very good reason. Every paediatrician has a slide like this, describing children as not, not being like little adults, specifically here in their cardiovascular physiology. So they may look like adults, they may try to behave like adults, but they're definitely not little adults. Not only are they not little adults, they change as they get older. So you go from this age, huge changes in infancy, to this age, huge changes in teens. And that makes making any precise recommendations very difficult. Thus, if we look at, for example, one of the recommendations here, looking at uh, T-wave changes in uh, elite athletes and what should be normal and what should be abnormal. Uh, that, so more than one millimetre in depth and two or more leads. Well, let's look at what happens to the uh, lead two in the child. Day one. Uh, here you've got big R waves, you've got upright T-waves. Three months, big R waves, the T waves have flipped. And that, these, these become inverted in the first few days of life. Three years, smaller R waves, inverted T waves, and you've actually got partial right bundle branch block here. And that's very, very common in young children, probably 10 to 20%. Eight years, again, the R waves are going down, the S waves are, are, are starting to appear. T waves still inverted. You go through puberty. You end up with the T waves upright, smaller R waves, deeper S waves, and quite commonly you see J point elevation. So, all these features make it very difficult to decide what is normal, what is abnormal. And perhaps the nubbins is when is puberty? And that varies. In fact, it's changing year on year. Puberty is getting younger and younger in children in this country. Um, not only are there ECG changes, there's age related echo changes. So if you're measuring a heart, you have to index it for body surface area, and there's Z scores for these things. Some normal ranges are really unknown. We don't really know what the tissue Doppler normative values are for children, uh, bearing in mind that children change rapidly uh, during their, their lives as they grow. We know very, very little about the effect of ethnicity in children, and we know a little bit about the effect of athletic training, but again, only for very small uh, numbers of children and different, uh, very small numbers of sports. So it's clear that there is a, the phenomenon of athletic heart in the child. So we know that the LV chamber size increases. We know that there's no change in relaxation or in tissue Doppler. We know that there's increased hypertrophy and stroke volume, all relatively similar to the adult. But whereas it's extremely difficult to uh, assess some, in some adults whether or not it's athletic heart as opposed to um, uh, uh, pathological changes. In the child, it becomes even more difficult. So to actually distinguish between athletic heart and, and uh, pathology in a child is extremely difficult. So existing protocols exclude under the age of 14. Children are different from adults. And the question really is, when do the adult ECG and echo changes manifest? Well, Putting another way, when does a boy become a man? Now, my wife's here with me. She helps in, uh, run the sports cardiology service. I asked Maggie, when does a boy become a man? And that was her card that she gave me. 
which I think was making a rather personal comment. <coughs> so, back to that original question, should we screen? Well, I'd like to give a definitive answer. Emotionally, I think, yes, we should, probably, maybe. Well, actually, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if I could distinguish with definitely between pathology at any one age group and non-pathology. I feel I could, but it would be difficult, and to put that down in writing would be very difficult. So I'd like to finish with three case histories, uh, which illustrate some of the issues. Uh, three children that I've seen um, in the last uh, matter of months. This is Ben. He's a 12-year-old footballer and plays in the uh, county team. He has a murmur. And there is no screening for 12-year-olds for, uh, for cardiac disease, even footballers. But he was referred to one of my colleagues uh, for cardiology assessment because of his heart murmur. So in effect, this was a screen because he had a normal echo. But before they come and see the cardiologist, they automatically have an ECG. And that's just what happens in our department. And this was his ECG. And those of you that have got your eye in uh, will recognize that there's clear pre-excitation. There's a short PR interval, there's a delta wave. So this is asymptomatic pre-excitation, um, suggesting there's an accessory pathway bypassing his AV node. Asymptomatic pre-excitation often isn't asymptomatic. And when you, when you asked Ben, he said, yeah, my car does flutter from time to time. It suddenly goes. It doesn't last for longer than maybe 10 minutes. So I don't bother about it. Uh, so this young sir had Wolf Parkinson White syndrome. Um, he didn't, he, we put him through an exercise test and showed that the accessory pathway was still present when he was at peak exercise, so at a, at a heart rate of over 200. Uh, he was still conducting through his accessory pathway, which is a slightly worrying sign. It means that if he goes into atrial fibrillation, as even 12-year-olds can do with Wolf Parkinson White, potentially this could be a rapidly conducting pathway. So he should definitely be treated in some way or other. He didn't want to take drugs, so he went for an electrophysiology study. He had an ablation. Here you can see the delta wave. The energy's been turned on back here somewhere. And within a matter of four or five beats, you get separation of the electrograms here, loss of the delta wave, and he is now cured. And there's been a number of patients I've seen, some have come through CRY, where the small risk of sudden death in Wolf Parkinson and White syndrome has been permanently abolished uh, by an ablation. So was he detectable on screening? If it were available, yes, he was. What was the action? Well, he did a successful ablation. The outcome is he's discharged and he's cured. That's a pretty good argument for screening. What about this chap? Um, this youngster is also a footballer. He's a 13-year-old. And in February this year, he was, um, <coughs> he'd scored three goals. He was playing for, I've forgotten which team he was playing for, actually, but he was playing um, in a professional team junior uh, competition and he made it onto the news because he suffered a cardiac arrest um, he was resuscitated thankfully and this was his diagnosis he had a right coronary artery this is a CT scan, coronal view pulmonary artery here, aorta here this is the right coronary artery coming off the pulmonary artery now it should in fact be coming off the aorta when you exercise one of the things that happens is your pulmonary artery dilates and so this right coronary was constricted between his aorta and his pulmonary artery. And if you compress your right coronary artery, this is what happens, you have ventricular fibrillation. The challenge is always to know why it happened in that particular occasion and never before. Nonetheless, he had successful surgery, his coronary artery was reimplanted, and this is five months later, and he's back playing football. So this chat, was it detectable in screening? Well, no, it wasn't. Uh, there is really no screening protocol that would detect this. And as Sanji mentioned earlier, the only way you can be absolutely sure you might pick it up on echo much more likely you won't. So if you've got somebody with chest pain, um, collapsing on exercise, you've got to know the coronary arteries are normal. So there's really no protocol that would pick this up uh, on uh, screening unless you were CT scanning or MRI scanning everybody. Action, well, he had surgical reimplantation, which is successful, and he's back playing football. So this wouldn't have been picked up with the screening of under 14-year-olds. And what about this last girl? Well, this is a 14-year-old tennis player, and Sanji was actually involved with her at one point. Um, junior Wimbledon level, and she went to a French competition. And in this particular French competition, everybody had an obligatory ECG. And this was her ECG. And uh, this shows that her QT interval was prolonged. It worked out at 0 0.5, 0 0.51, in fact. Um, but you can see there's very abnormal-looking uh, ST segments with this sort of uh, 
rather slurring of the upstroke to the T wave. So she is some form of long QT. Uh, she was genotyped, and she turned out to have long QT5. This is a very rare form. In fact, there's only 16 reports of this particular form of long QT syndrome. And that means we don't really know what the prognosis is. Um, the authors concluded that, you should, uh, that they may become pathogenic in situations such as where they're hypokalemic, it's a potassium channel um, anomaly, or where they're given QT-prolonging drugs. So this very talented um, player, I, I bounced her around the country, and I think she was discussed with John Cam and also with Sanjay, and we agreed we should start a beta blocker. She was advised to avoid exercise, or, which was a moderate or significant hemodynamic stress, and that's because that's what the Bethesda recommendations would nowadays recommend. Um, and... Uh, in retrospect, I wonder whether perhaps there was an alternative strategy. And you'll see outside, not a life pack, but you'll see uh, there's all wearable defibrillator. And maybe that's a solution for some of these patients. Because all she needed was to have access to a defibrillator wherever she was playing for the, what was like to be the very small risk of a VF arrest. So was this detectable in screening? Yes, it was. The action, well, she ended up stopping sport, um, taking a beta blocker. She also had a number of teenage tantrums in my clinic, which I remember painfully well, because she didn't want to stop playing tennis. She, she's happy about it now. And the outcome was, well, she's undergoing long-term follow-up, but I still don't know what her prognosis is. I've no idea whether picking this up will have altered her outcome or not. So how should we then screen if we're going to screen? Well, I propose the new Seattle criteria. Um, and I'd like to call them the Great Portland Street Seattle criteria. Um, and a different group of authors, I think Professor Sharma should be the first author, but we get these, these chaps in to help him. And in these new criteria, I'd like to understand the normal changes in teenagers. We need big studies, not studies of 20 patients uh, with varying degrees of sporting background. I'd like us to be able to define, as we have done in the adults, what is normality and what is abnormality, look at the effects of ethnicity, and look at the effects in much more detail of training on the teenage athlete's heart. If we did that, then perhaps we could be able to assess asymptomatic athletes. Um, but for the moment, I think uh, we have to assess symptomatic athletes. So if they're under 14, my suggestion is that we simply assess symptomatic uh, athletes, not asymptomatic. But when we assess families, do remember that they have children and that some of these will be at uh, risk of whatever the family inherited cardiac condition is, and they should be assessed properly. We need proper family screening. We need to ensure sports fields have AEDs, and still there's a surprising and frightening number of sports fields and gyms that do not have these. And we need to encourage non-athletes to exercise. Remember that vast population, not the elite athletes, but the children who are doing less and less exercise, getting more and more obese. That lot. Thank you.